recorded for uh, folks that maybe aren't able to join us live. It will be posted onto our webpage for uh, people to come back and review the slide presentation along with the presentation provided. Um, so that's, uh, recording is beginning now and I just wanna let everybody be aware of that. And I'll walk us through a little housekeeping here. This is our virtual public meeting. Um, if you want to go back and take a look at the recording, the link will be posted on our disposition study webpage. Um, that'll probably be by the end of this week. It takes a couple days for the recorded file to become available. So don't look for it immediately, but by the end of the week, it will be posted on our webpage uh, for reference for uh, those that want to go back and take another look or for anybody that was not able to join us live. So our agenda for today, we're starting with our introductions. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some participation tips since we are uh, doing this in a virtual platform. I think everybody is getting very used to these uh, virtual meetings and virtual platforms, but I wanna talk a little bit about how that's gonna work specifically for our meeting today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about where to go for more information. We have a lot of information on our webpage, and I hope many of you have had the chance to download the draft report as well as the pre-brief slides, which cover a lot of information, um, may have answered some questions already, and can help uh, guide the questions and discussion uh, that we have today. Um, then we'll get into the presentation. I'll turn it over to Nan. She's going to walk us through uh, a somewhat shorter presentation today to allow most of our time together for questions and answers. Um, before we get into our live questions and answers, we will talk about how to post official comments on the draft disposition study and uh, the pathway and procedure for submitting any letters of interest in the site. Um, and we'll cover the due date for comments. Then we'll get into our question and answer session. So for the questions during this meeting, um, you'll find when you enter the virtual meeting platform that you're in a listen only mode. So we're gonna be doing the questions using the chat feature. So if you're unable to access that chat feature or you're um, just on audio, you're not in the WebEx platform, um, our other option is to send an email message to the MPL Locks disposition at usace.army.mil email address, and that's on our website as well. And questions coming into that email account will be monitored throughout this meeting, and we'll try to address those live as well. Um, and that's the same email to use for a formal comment later following the meeting. Uh, something else occurs to you that you wanna ask, or if you want to make an official written comment, you can send it to that email address as well. During the meeting today, the questions and answers are not going to be uh, formally recorded. So if you want a written comment to be captured on the record during the comment period for this study, please submit your comment in writing, um, either sent by mail to our district office or to this email address as well. So we'll cover that um, at the end when we talk about submitting comments and the timeline to do so. But just right up front, I wanna make people aware that we're here today to uh, take advantage of being all together in this virtual platform um, with our team of experts, our study team, to answer questions. But if you want to have something um, formally submitted on the record as a comment, to please do that in writing separately from this meeting. So tips for participating and to send those chat questions as we go, you'll see down on the bottom corner of your screen the participant list and the chat list. When you open up that participant list, you can see everybody that's here. Um, you can send messages directly to me, particularly if you're having any technology issues. As I said, I'll be managing the, the room, our technical space, our WebEx room that we're in. So if you're having any uh, technical issues, you can message me directly and I'll try to work with you uh, to make sure that you're able to follow along and participate. Um, otherwise, for your questions in the chat, please make sure that you set that chat to everyone and we'll use uh, that chat box to uh, monitor questions and go through and answer questions. Um, I invite you to enter a question into the chat at any time. We will wait until Nan has finished her presentation to start going through those questions and responding to questions. So if you have a question on you know, slide 10, go ahead and put it in the chat. We'll be monitoring that and we'll go through those at the end of the presentation. Um, I'll also note that although I'm um, facilitating the 
WebEx room, and Nan is doing the presentation. We have several of our study team subject matter experts on the line with us as well today. Uh, we're not going to introduce them all at the front end here, but we will call on them and invite them to come off mute if they have the technical expertise to best answer a question that comes up as we go through the presentation. I mentioned that we have a lot of information on our webpage, so here's the webpage address and a screenshot of the draft report that's available there. Um, I hope you've already had the chance to take a look at that. If not, um, please do visit our website, download the report, and there's also a very extensive 89-slide pre-brief that's posted there. We're going to be going through a much shorter version of that presentation today, but for all of the background information, um, please do visit our webpage, and you'll find those materials uh, right here on the front of the Disposition Study webpage, our virtual meeting pre roll slideshow, as well as the draft report. So for today, we'll be going over the highlights of that longer presentation, and I'll turn it over to Nan to start walking us through that. Yes, thank you, Sierra, and again, welcome, everyone. The purpose of today's meeting is to summarize the Upper St. Anthony Falls Draft Disposition Study Report, summarize the Corps' tentatively selected plan, to invite your public comments and statements of interest in the ownership of the lock, to address your questions today, and also to summarize the next steps of the study. The overall purpose of the disposition study is first to identify whether or not there is a federal interest in continuing to own and operate Upper St. Anthony Falls. And if not, if uh, there is not, uh, to identify if there is a viable disposal alternative. Just to note, uh, we realize that there is outside interest in the core remaining at the site, but this does not mean that there is a federal interest in remaining at the site. This will be some review from the uh, presentation that's on our website. The Upper St. Anthony Falls Lock was constructed in 1963 as part of the Minneapolis Upper Harbor Project. Its primary authorized purpose was to extend commercial navigation to the Minneapolis Upper Harbor. The city of Minneapolis was the local sponsor for the project. You can see from the chart on this slide the trend in the number of lockages between 1963 and 2015. The peak in navigation occurred in the 1920s, sorry, 1990s, but you can see there was a distinct upward and downward trend. Uh, the no number of blockages plummeted in approximately 2012 uh, when concern arose over the um, spread of invasive Asian carp in the Mississippi River. In June of 2014, Congress ordered the upper lock closed to navigation. In December of 2014, the Minneapolis, the city of Minneapolis closed its upper harbor to river-based commerce. The upper lock finally closed in June of 2015. And upon this closure then, the lock was no longer serving its authorized purpose of navigation. Following the closure, the Corps began the disposition study effort first with a combined study of all three Twin Cities locks, including Upper and Lower St. Anthony Falls and Lock and Dam 1. We conducted meetings in the summer of 2018. Congress passed the Water Resources Development Act of 2018 in October of that year, which directed the Corps to study the upper lock first and separately from the other two locks. In 2019, we started the current study for the upper lock, beginning with scoping meetings held in August of 2019. Throughout the rest of 2019 and 2020, we worked on developing and evaluating alternatives and performing internal review on the draft report. We released the draft report uh, for public review in December of 2020. We paused the review for just a few weeks while we updated it um, in accordance with Word of 2020. Then following this public review, we will consider comments 
uh, prior, prior to finalizing the report. We expect to forward the final report from here in the St. Paul District in September of this year for consideration by Congress. As part of the study, we examined the current conditions and uses of the site. None of the current uses are related to our primary authorized purpose of navigation. We have an agreement with the National Park Service for conducting tours at the site. We do have an occasional uh, public open house, such as the Minneapolis Open Doors that was held a year or so ago, maybe more than a year ago, and the event that we held in October of 2020, in which we opened the site for public view uh, during the drawdown of the Mississippi River. Periodic inspections are done on a five-year cycle. Uh, we operate the upstream tainter gate to ensure that the gate is not only in good working order, but we also operate the gate occasionally to pass flood flows. We maintain access for public safety reasons for the Minneapolis Fire and Rescue and the Hennepin County Water Patrol. Excel Energy has retained rights to cross the property to maintain their dam. And I want to note that even though the project is used for passing river flows, flood control is not a specifically authorized purpose for the project. Our primary purpose is navigation. As a federal site, we still have to maintain the project. This includes ma maintaining the concrete structure, the gates and operating equipment, the security system, which includes uh, the lighting, the alarms, and the fencing. We maintain the buildings on the ground, the metal structures, including the hand railing, the pedestrian bridge, and the stairways. As I said, we also perform safety inspections. In the spring, sometimes we have to prepare the structure to pass flows, which may involve the ice in the gate or the upstream approach to the lock. Uh, our ability, however, to do maintenance and operation at the site has been complicated by a reduction in staff. In fact, during our peak operating years, we had staff on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And in the past, there was plenty of staff on hand to do the maintenance at the site. Currently, there's no permanent staff at Upper St. Anthony Falls and we rely on staff at Lower St. Anthony Falls and Lock and Dam 1 to operate and maintain the site. However, the staff at those other two locks has also been reduced due to reduced demand for navigation services. Many repairs and flood preparations are performed by our maintenance and repair crew, which is based in Fountain City, Wisconsin. This crew services all 13 locks in the St. Paul District extending from Minneapolis to Guttenberg, Iowa. And their time is often prioritized to those sites that still serve commercial navigation. Operation and maintenance for core navigation uh, uh, infrastructure <laughs> is budgeted on a year-by-year -year basis. Uh, the core has a, na a nationwide inventory of thousands of navigation structures. Funding is limited and it's prioritized again to those structures that have uh, active navigation. Since the upper lock no longer serves navigation, it is anticipated to get low priority for operations funding. We've already seen some uh, minor maintenance deferred at the upper lock and we expect over the years if uh, things continue that we may see additional deterioration. As part of the study, we put together an estimate of what it would cost to the core to maintain the project in its current condition over the next 50 years. This would be our 50-year holding costs. And we estimated that this would be approximately $7 million. Uh, as more time passes, it, however, it may get harder and harder to justify spending our limited operations funds on a non-navigation project. So even though $7 million doesn't sound like very much. Um, it varies from year to year, and we may have difficulty getting the funds we need. 
We will do our best to preserve the historic nature of the structure, uh, but this will become a challenge in the future. And we foresee maybe even taking some steps to reduce our long-term maintenance costs. Now, during our plan formulation uh, and alternative analysis, we, we remained mindful of the challenges of future operation and maintenance, not only from the core standpoint, but also potentially from the standpoint of a future owner. On the next few slides, I'll summarize our plan formulation phase. The core uses a six-step planning process to formulate and evaluate alternatives and come up with, with what we call the tentatively selected plan. We document this plan in the draft disposition study report and we publish the report for public review. We're now in the middle of that review. Uh, in December, we issued a press release and posted a notice on our public website and also on our social media uh, indicating that the report was available. This public meeting is part of that process of, um, uh, sorry, informing the public and giving the public the chance to pose questions before the comment period ends on March 18th. And before I get into describing the alternatives we considered, I want to touch briefly on some legislation that was included in the Water Resources Development Act which was signed into law on December 27, 2020. I'll be referring to this as WERDA 2020. Section 356 of WERDA 2020 involves conveyance of federal property, and Section 356F directs the Secretary, meaning the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, to convey lands at Upper St. Anthony Falls to the city of Minneapolis or its designees. We have not yet received guidance on how to implement this section of WERDA 2020, but we do acknowledge in the draft report that some of the lands at Upper St. Anthony Falls may be or will be disposed of separately from the rest of the project. Uh, we have already had one meeting with the city of Minneapolis. However, the extent of the lands to be conveyed under WERDA 2020 have not been yet been determined. In the following slides, whenever I refer to structures and lands when describing alternatives, um, I'm referring to structures and lands that are not otherwise conveyed under WERDA 2020. And I'll, I'll try and keep saying that. These are the five alternatives that were considered in the study. The no action alternative would continue the core operation and maintenance responsibilities at the site retaining all structures and any lands, again, not otherwise transferred under WERDA 2020, and the estimated cost over 50 years was $7 million. Alternative one would involve full disposal of all lands and structures at the site, again, exclusive of what might be conveyed under WERDA 2020. The core would incur only the cost of disposal of those features. This alternative was deemed hard to implement without a willing uh, future owner being identified. Alternative 1A, similar to Alternative 1, would involve full disposal of all structures and lands at the site, again, exclusive of what might be conveyed under WERDA 2020, but it would also offer a monetary incentive to the new owner. Now, this monetary incentive hasn't been determined yet. It would be negotiated and it could be used to offset the new owner's future operation and maintenance costs. This alternative was deemed to be more implementable than alternative one, as it lessens the uncertainty that a willing owner could be identified. The Water Resources Development Act of 2018 required the Corps to consider partial disposal alternatives while retaining the core presence at the site. Excuse me. Uh, alternative 2 and 2A both involve a partial disposal. Alternative 2 would involve a partial disposal of all features not used for passing flood flows. This alternative 
presuppose that the government would continue to incur all operation and maintenance costs for any retained features in, addi in addition to any disposal costs for what is uh, uh, disposed of as excess property. Again, this is exclusive of any property that is conveyed under WERDA 2020. This alternative is not recommended as is essentially the same cost to the government as the no action alternative. There's very little, if any, savings to the government under alternative two. Alternative 2A is similar to alternative two in that the government continues to own and operate the facilities needed for passing flood flows but the core's future operation and maintenance costs would be funded by a local sponsor. This alternative would require a new congressional authorization, followed by developing and signing a project partnership agreement between a local sponsor and the government. Any property not needed for passing flood flows could still be disposed of. Again, this is exclusive of any property that's conveyed under WERDA 2020. This alternative was not recommended due to the difficulty and length of time needed to identify a local sponsor, reauthorize the project, and develop an agreement to fund future costs. This arrangement would also introduce some ambiguity about the responsibility for the future uh, of the site. For instance, if uh, the project sponsor fails to fund the core operations, what happens then? As a final note on these alternatives, uh, the monetary incentive offered under alternative 1A would not be offered under any other alternative. And the, money, uh, the uh, monetary incentive would not be offered for lands conveyed under WERDA 2020. As summarized in our draft report, after evaluation and comparison of the alternatives, the study concludes that the project no longer serves its authorized purpose and continued operation and maintenance of the site is not in the federal interest. This alternative best meets our study objectives, or the, the alternative that best meets study objectives is alternative one, the deauthorization of the project and complete disposal of the property. Again, exclusive of whatever lands are conveyed under WERDA 2020, combined with a monetary incentive for expediting the disposal. Again, the tentatively selected plan recommends that all federal missions at the site be deauthorized and the entire site disposed of. The tentatively selected plan recommends that Congress uh, authorize the core to be given two years in which to negotiate the terms of the transfer of the property uh, not included in WERDA 2020, and that the monetary incentive be authorized to be paid to the new owner. The report concludes that the tentatively selected plan, uh, because it involves transfer of the property in an as-is condition, would not have significant environmental effects. The, uh, act, the federal action, which is to transfer the property, has no environmental effects. This does not take into account what future uses might uh, occur with a future owner. That, that's something that we do not know at this time. The tentatively selected plan is consistent with WERDA 2020 as the property conveyed to the city of Minneapolis would not be affected by the transfer of the rest of the property. These are all the features that would be disposed of. This would include any lands that are disposed of under WERDA 2020, so those are not separated on this drawing. It essentially includes all structures that were constructed by the core. Uh, the core would retain an access on the road leading to the lower lock, and Excel Energy would retain their access rights to the dam. So, provide, uh, identifying interesting, <laughs> interested parties. Uh, while conducting this public review of the draft report, we are providing this, uh, an opportunity for interested parties to express interest in future ownership. All interested future owners are encouraged to submit a letter of interest to the St. Paul District Commander. We're hoping that an inter interested party will step forward in the next few months. However, 
if no one steps forward, we still intend to finalize the report with our recommendations in anticipation that uh, a willing owner may still be identified within the next two years. We are asking Congress to give us two years to negotiate the transfer to the new owner. However, if uh, Congress authorizes the disposal and we are unable to negotiate a transfer within two years, the property disposal will likely revert to the General Services Administration procedure and the property would be disposed of according to federal laws and priorities. Our, our message here is that whatever happens, uh, we're anticipating that this study for Upper St. Anthony Falls will end this year and we will be moving on to the next study. And as Sierra said, the draft report is available on the Minneapolis Box Disposition Study webpage. We'll be accepting comments through March 18th. Comments may be submitted electronically or written comments may be sent to the St. Paul District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to the attention of the Regional Planning and Environment our environmental division north. Comments will become part of the public record and will be included in the final report. Statements of interest are preferred in the form of a formal letter. Guidance on what to include in the letter is included in the draft report. Written statements of interest should be addressed to Colonel Carl D. Jansen, the commander of the St. Paul District. These statements of interest will also be included and considered in the final report. Thank you for your attention. Uh, now I will turn control back to Sierra and we will look through the questions in the chat box. Great, thank you, Nan. And thank you to everyone who has gotten the ball rolling here with questions coming into the chat box. Um, as we begin to go through these, I will um, just again note that um, we do want to address questions during our time together here. So anything that's um, a comment, we'll acknowledge that in the chat, but please make sure to submit your comments um, through the methods provided on the website or to this email address in order to have um, your position or the position of your agency captured um, for the record. And what we're going to really be focused on today is, is questions. Um, and you notice several folks are on camera, um, and that's, that's fine if you prefer that, but um, for the sake of bandwidth, if folks want to turn their camera off, that's fine. We're going to be mostly just um, going through the chat here today, and I'll be calling on um, some of our team members to go ahead and, and respond as we go through these. So we'll start working through from the first one. And um, if you want to, if you have a question coming to you now, go ahead and put it in the chat. We'll just work down through them in order. Um, our meeting time is really kind of as long as it takes to answer these questions. We're scheduled to go till four. If we get through these questions, um, we won't, you know, make you hang out. We can adjourn. We'll have everything captured in the recording. Um, but as, as long as people have questions, our team's here and, and able to, to answer those. So go ahead and enter those in the chat, and we will come to those. Um, the first question here from John Amphenson, I'm going to go ahead and unmute um, David Potter, our lead biologist and the lead on the EA asking if the EA and FONSI cover all matters related to the transfer of the property to the city or as a designee. Dave, do you want to take that one? I'll try. Um, this, <clears throat> this EA is uh, unlike any other EA I've worked on because we don't really see a concrete proposal where there's a physical or operational change uh, to the project. So we're working a little outside the box on this EA. Um, and you will come across uh, a few statements that describes how we look, decided to look at that in the, in the report. But basically, uh, the way we're looking at it is we're comparing conditions um, for a reasonable range of alternatives, and we recognize that there's some degree of property transfer, but we don't assume any physical or operational change from the current conditions. And you know, while we think there could be, uh, you know, each of the action alternatives could, could realize a different future for Upper St. Anthony Falls, you know, identifying those environmental effects is going to be largely speculative. 
and so we don't conclude any real effects to the resources. Um, you know, having said that, you know, Word of 2020 is directing us to, you know, um, direct some portion of the project to the city, and we're hearing that there's interest in having this become a, some kind of a tourist destination, but I haven't really seen any concrete plans for what that is, what specific portions of the property they're, they're, the city's interested in, and what they plan to build there. Um, we could try to maybe relook at it and maybe try to examine it on, a, on a, a, maybe a qualitative basis, what that effect may be. But um, again, I don't want to get into too much speculation. I do believe, though, too, that once there is some more concrete plans to do something with that property, um, that that would trigger a federal nexus of some sorts, whether it's an agreement between the city and the, and the core or some kind of transfer of properties. Uh, and that, to me, when there is more formal de details on what's going to happen there, would trigger NEPA again. So we would be looking at another NEPA document to address the effects of that more that more concrete proposal. At least that's my opinion. So I guess what I'm saying is I, I would believe another EA or some other document, NEPA document, would be needed when there's a concrete plan in place. Over. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, let's move on to the next question here from Chris with the National Park Conservation Association. So the, the first part of that stating that the um, NPCA does not support the preferred alternative 1A. Um, thanks for sharing that, Chris, and I think that falls into the category of a comment. So again, if you want that on the record, please submit that in writing. And as far as the question here, has the Army Corps received any um, Statements of interest to date, uh, the answer to that is no. Um, so as Nan said, our public comment period is open through March 18th, and um, we will accept statements of interest beyond that time, but as of, as of now, uh, no, we have not. Um, and let's move on then to the question from Mark with Friends of the Falls. Again, thank you for the comment. Um, regarding not supporting option one, and I'll reiterate once more to make sure that those comments are provided in writing to go on the record. Um, and move on then to the question, how does the core explain its determination of acceptability to stakeholders and what steps are required by law to declare excess land and dispose of the property surrounding the lot as soon as practicable as required by law? Nan, do you want to jump in and take that one or someone from our real estate team? I think I can take part of it. Um, so how does the core explain it, its determination of acceptability to stakeholders? And I think during, yeah, and Sierra, you can correct me, but um, the acceptability um, determination, you know, I, I think it included mostly what's acceptable from the federal standpoint. Um, do you remember any more of the discussion on that? Yeah, as far as acceptability, we look at acceptability in terms of um, compliance with laws and standards, um, compliance with the federal interest in core mission areas. We don't define acceptability based simply on what people like and don't like. Um, we certainly are interested in that and want to have a valid documentation of the different viewpoints and um, stakeholder acceptance of the plan. But as far as using that as a criteria, we look at you know, acceptability in terms of uh, being in compliance with laws and policy and guidance. And um, as far as the excess land is our real estate on Dave W. There, I got to mute twice. Sorry. Uh, the question is: uh, Required by law for uh, declare excess land. Would, would it depend upon 
is if it's mission essential. And since navigation has closed down, it is no longer mission essential. Okay, and once we, um, at some point we declare it as excess, and then what happens, Dave? It goes through the process through Congress to determine if we have a federal entity uh, interested in it. If no interested parties are in it, we have the option for um, our tentative plan of two, I believe it is. If not, then it goes to GSA to dispose of. Okay. And then GSA has a list of priorities that they uh, use. They, they will offer up the property first to a uh, federal entity. Uh, if there are no other federal entities that are interested in the site, then it um, gets off, offered up to um, like state and local entities with a public purpose. Um, and then I think it uh, goes to negotiated sale, and if that doesn't work, it um, goes down to uh, uh, sale by bid. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dave. Uh, let's move on here to the next question here from Margaret Richardson. What are the obstacles to conveying the surrounding property to the city of Minneapolis or its designee within the year? Um, so it sounds like that's a question referring to the direction in WERDA 2020. And I'll take a stab on it and then see, Nan, if you'd like to add anything. Um, I guess my initial thought is at this point, I don't think that we know if there are or are not obstacles. We're at the very beginning of that process. And from the core side, the first thing we'll be waiting for is implementation guidance um, to direct us in how to proceed with that conveyance and direct uh, how that work from the core side will be funded. Uh, following that, there will be some survey requirements and then uh, work between the real estate and legal teams to uh, work out the details of that conveyance. So as to what the obstacles are or if in fact there are any, I think we're so early in the process, I don't, I don't know that we can really address that. Is there anything you would add, Nan? No, I, I think that that's correct. I mean, we, we have had discussions with the city of Minneapolis, and so we've started thinking about it, but um, we have not made any progress on that particular. Thank you. Okay, let's move on then to the next question regarding maintenance. Any architectural or landscape architectural improvements to the lock about the land abutting the lock will be impacted by the seepage that can be observed in the wall. What will be done to repair that wall prior to conveyance? Uh, I think I can answer that one too. Um, again, our intent is to um, trans transfer it in as is condition. That's the, typically what is done for disposition study. Thanks, Nan. Um, moving on to the next comment, um, again, comment that Friends of the Mississippi River does not support the preferred option. Uh, thank you for that, and uh, please be sure to submit that uh, in writing as an official comment and adding, we're not aware of any community or local acceptance of this option. Um, and then goes on to ask, how can the court consider abandoning the property to an unknown, unproven party when the infrastructure is critically tied to water supply, flood control, and invasive species management? And why would a private interest want to take on maintenance responsibilities in perpetuity? Okay, I can try to answer that one. Um, these are somewhat rhetorical questions because um, we don't know who would be interested in taking on the maintenance responsibilities. Um, as far as the unknown, I mean, there are some entities that we um, would like to stand forward and um, stake a claim in, in their interest in the structure particularly the water supply. Um, we know that water supply is tied to the health of the entire damming surface, not just the small parts that the 
Corps of Engineers, or rather the United States government owns, but also what Excel owns as well. Um, and at this point, we just don't know who is going to step forward. There are definitely some uh, stakeholders out there who could step forward and take over ownership. And they have the opportunity at this point and even you know, up to two years from now to stand forward and stake their claim. Thanks, Nan. Um, next question is, have you accounted for the economic or cultural benefits of recreation, tourism, and interpretation in your cost-benefit analysis? And uh, maybe I can address this quickly and then bring in our economist, Jeff McGrath, to respond a little bit more. Um, we've addressed those elements qualitatively, but not quantitatively, primarily because most of the investments and benefits are at a regional scale, and we're looking at this from the national perspective. But I'll take our economist staff mute and see if there's anything you want to add there, Jeff. If he's able to hop on. Okay, well, we'll maybe circle back and see if he's able to expand on my explanation. Oh, there he comes. I was uh, trying to unmute myself here, and I guess I wasn't able to. But, uh, again, from a cost-benefit standpoint, I guess we look at the benefits of, of this, of this uh, proposal or, or planned as, um, as cost savings. You know, which, which of the alternatives that we're looking at can, can save uh, the most costs uh, uh, from a federal perspective? Um, as far as looking at any kind of recreation, cultural type benefits, uh, th th those don't enter into a uh, cost benefit uh, a sort of um, uh, equation or calculation. Uh, th they might they might account for uh, benefits on maybe a, a kind, of, kind of qualitative manner, but uh, um, from a kind of ec economic perspective, uh, uh, the economics of this. Uh, and, and the, the benefit there again is cost savings of, of one be, of one plan over another. I think that's why the uh, that's one of the reasons why um, uh, the plan one A has uh, been selected as a, as a tentatively selected plan for now. Uh, because uh, again, I think I think it brings the most cost savings to 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 the government uh, um, if if that plan is implemented. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, the next question, could disposal also include partial removal paid for by the Corps of Engineers? Um, and I can try to address this and then maybe turn it over to Nan to add on a little bit there. We were directed to consider partial removal uh, for this and future disposition studies. And we looked at that opportunity at this site, and that was screened out pretty early on the process because of the functions provided by the damming surface at Upper St. Anthony Falls. Um, and also the, of the damming surface, really only the lock portion is owned by the Corps of Engineers. Most of the Horseshoe Dam and, and much of the site is not owned by the Corps of Engineers. So that's something we explored early in the process and, and screened out. It, uh, detailed pretty extensively in our report and also outlined um, in the larger slide deck. So at this point, that's no longer under consideration, but it will be considered for future disposition studies. Is there anything you would want to add to that, Nan? Yeah, um, I, I do want to add maybe a different perspective on the question. Um, we did consider just, you know, removal as we are required to under um, Order 2018, Section 1168. And I think the question may be asking, you know, could the damming surface stay and maybe part of the structure be removed? And I think that um, that could all be subject to negotiations with a new future owner. Um, there have been past uh, dispositions of federal, you know, locks uh, where removal of the structure, in this case, we're talking about partial remover, removal. Um, was included in 
the disposal plan. Um, so the federal government has invested money at the request of the new owner you know, as part of the transfer agreement. Okay. Great, thanks for adding that. Okay. Um, next question is uh, looking for some clarity around the proposed financial incentive to the new owner. Does the Corps currently have the funds? What is the amount under consideration? And which account do these come, funds come out of? How are they appropriated? Um, do you want to tackle this one, Nan? Yeah, I will do that, yeah. Um, the Corps does not currently have these funds. We don't have the authority to spend the government funds. It would, Congress, it would have to be Congress that would authorize the payment. Um, and I'm not sure exactly which account the funds would come out of. Um, this is all kind of new. Uh, but yeah, that is the intent is that Congress would authorize the disposal and deauthorization and authorize the funding for it. Um, again, we don't know what the amount would be. Not having a, a willing owner step forward, we don't know what their price is. Um, but yeah, that, that can be determined, but it really is not ultimately up to the court. It is up to Congress. Thank you. All right, next question here is, how is preserving and facilitating the water supply for over 1 million people of the Twin Cities and supporting all the businesses that rely on that water not in the federal interest? Have you accounted for the cost of flood or water damage, water supply damage and repair if the lock were to be improperly maintained by a new owner? Okay, I, I guess I can take another stab at this too. Um, so right now the Corps of Engineers in this project are authorized for uh, commercial navigation uh, on the river. We're not authorized for uh, operating for flood damage reduction. We're not authorized for water supply. So in, in that way, um, no, it, it's not in the federal interest. We don't operate for those. Um, it, it's in the local and regional interest that the damming surface remain there, um, but it, that is not a function of the federal government at this time. Uh, there were owners of this dam before the federal government took over the site, and there can be non-federal owners in the future. And um, the cost of flood, uh, water supply damage, if the lock were improperly maintained by its new owner, we have no guarantee of that. I mean, again, that's why we're hoping that a responsible future owner stands up and uh, recognizes that the water supply is an important issue and they would like to retain control of it. Great, thank you, Nan. Um, next question, is GSA willing to accept the lock and related property for a public conveyance given the critical responsibilities that come with it? Um, Nan, I'll, I'll let you add on, but I think the, the short answer is yes. We certainly haven't heard anything to the contrary. Yeah, that, that's about it. I mean, once we, um, identify a property as access to the needs of the federal government, we turn to GSA for the disposal. Okay, I'm gonna take our cultural resources team member off, the, uh, off of mute here to answer the next question about the section 106 process. The draft report says the Corps has partially completed the section 106 process, but the process is not officially started. What is the status and will it be completed before signing the FONSI is the question. So I'm gonna turn that over to Brad Perkle, our cultural resources lead. Thank you, so, Sierra. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the process has officially started. We sent a letter to the State Historic Preservation Office this past week. Um, so that will kick off a whole bunch of um, discussions and meetings and 
Um, we'll probably have a programmatic agreement um, in part to uh, address the, the FONSI. Um, so we'll, we're still kind of early. We don't know which way things are going to roll out, but we will uh, work through it. Over. Great. Thanks, Brad. Okay, the next two questions are kind of related, so I think I'm going to just read them both and then we can um, address both of them. First is, who will be evaluating proposals for future ownership at the site and how will those proposals be evaluated? Uh, and then in a similar vein, the next question is, will the Army Corps use some sort of vetting of any potential interested parties such that there would be protections to prevent an entity from simply being interested in the financial incentive, but no assurances the entity will continue to exist and maintain the facility. Is that one you want to address, Nan? Yeah, uh, I guess so. Um, yeah, we're, we're hoping that we get at least one uh, interested entity. Um, yeah, as far as evaluating proposals, you know, our preferred one is one that will take uh, the entire site off of our hands. Um, you know, and, and I recognize that there's significant concern out there that this site might go to somebody that isn't um, going to act in the best interest of all the rest of the stakeholders. Um, and we, uh, like I said, will include these statements of interest in our final report. Um, I, I don't know exactly how we're, we would make a recommendation, um, but it is ultimately going to be up to Congress to authorize to whom this project would go. Um, as far as, you know, taking the money and run, yeah, um, <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, and, yeah, I, I mean, hopefully the people that are interested in um, maintaining this structure, maintaining that damming surface will step forward and recognize that it can go to someone else. Over. Thanks, Nan. Okay, the next question here is um, regarding WERDA 2020, Congress has directed partial conveyance. Why wouldn't the Corps expediently proceed with the partial conveyance based on that congressional direction? 1A does not seem consistent with that congressional intent. Um, so I think I, I'll try to respond to that and then allow you to add on that or, or others if there's someone maybe from real estate that wants to chime in as well. Uh, I think it's, it's certainly our um, intention to expediently proceed with the partial conveyance. Um, as I said, you know, at this time, until we have further direction in the form of implementation guidance, there's uh, some limitations to what we can do or at the very early stages of that, but certainly it is our uh, intention to comply with that congressional direction and forthcoming implementation guidance um, and move as expediently as possible. And to the, the second part of the comment there, 1A does not seem consistent with that congressional intent. Uh, it's our belief that 1A is consistent with WERDA 2020 and also meeting the directions that we've received uh, in WERDA 2018 specifically to expedite completion of the disposition study. Uh, so we don't see it as following that congressional direction to abandon this effort. Uh, so we've been directed to complete the study, to expedite the study, uh, to be transparent in the study, and that's what we're trying to do today. So we're trying to meet the direction from Congress in WERDA 2018, which we believe we can do while simultaneously complying with the directions from Congress in WERDA 2020. Um, so anything that I left out or you want to add, Nan or others? No, I, I think that I would just add that there's no reason that the um, land conveyance directed under WERDA 2020 can't go on concurrently with us finishing uh, the rest of the, um, re this report, this study, and sending that uh, up for approval. Um, yeah, that, that can go on concurrently. The WERDA 2020 uh, transfer doesn't have to wait for this report to be approved. Over. Thanks for adding that clarification. Um, next question here 
says the past comment, a past comment by the standard bearer for lock closure, Senator Klobuchar, that was kind of a tongue twister for me, <laughs> was that if the issue of solving the Asian carp's advance is solved, the lock could reopen. If that could be achieved, why would we not want to keep the government entity best able to maintain it, the Corps of Engineers keep its responsibility? Um, so I think in a nutshell, could the lock ever reopen and assuming that as a future scenario, should the Corps maintain ownership? Um, so I can maybe take a stab at that and then I don't know if our biologist or Nan, if you would want to add on. Um, we do address that to some degree in our report and in the longer slide deck and our projections and assumptions about the future conditions are that the threat of aquatic invasive species will remain and that the uh, local desire and drive to reopen the lock for commercial navigation is, is not going to resume. So it's our assumption that the lock will remain closed to navigation. So we did try to take that into account as far as our assessment of assumptions for the future, and it's our assessment that there is not a likelihood that the lock will be reopened. Um, I don't know if Dave or Nan, either of you want to add anything. I don't. You covered it well. Okay. Uh, I do want to add one thing maybe from um, the operation maintenance and, and cost standpoint. Um, when we closed the lock to navigation in 2015, we um, kind of were on the verge of needing to do substantial um, maintenance and replacement work on the tall uh, miter gates that are on the downstream end, you know, at several multi-millions uh, cost in refurbishing those gates. Now, those gates have been um, tied back and the operators have been removed and, you know, they're not going to open, or sorry, they're not going to close again. So to restore navigation at um, this site will cost quite a bit of money. Um, so that could be one barrier to opening it up to navigation again. And then the thing is that uh, with um, uh, the Minneapolis Upper Harbor being closed for commercial you know, navigation purposes, that there aren't really uh, any uh, commercial users upstream anymore. I, I don't know, and I know that there is interest uh, in one of the comments that, you know, it would be nice to have it open for recreational um, blockages, but you know, with the expense uh, involved, I don't see that that could easily happen. Over. Okay, the next um, question here says, uh, Minra, which is the Mississippi National River Recreation Area, previously pointed out that the National Park Service would lose substantial oversight of development at the lock if it is deauthorized and disposed to a non-federal entity. Congress directed the National Park Service to protect, preserve, and enhance the nationally significant resources of the mineral corridor and the lock and surrounding resources are nationally significant. Why didn't the Corps address this comment in the draft and how will the Corps address this matter? Um, so it sounds like this may be um, a comment that uh, the uh, that MINRA or the National Park Service is intending to submit for a, a formal response. Um, I don't know if, if Nan, there's anything we want to address on this today or if we would just ask for this comment to be submitted formally. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not really sure how to operate or uh, how, how to respond to this. Um, I, I know that the National Park Service has uh, expressed this um, concern before. Uh, if we were to dispose of this site, um, the National Park Service being a federal entity could express interest in taking it over and therefore preserve their interest in this site. Um, however, the National Park Service I understand their position is that they do not want to do that. So I, I don't really know how to respond to that. Um, it's, you know, we, we're trying to come at this from the standpoint of 
um, federal government, um, and if another uh, agency of the federal government isn't owned and take, uh, isn't interested in taking it over, there's not a lot we can uh, respond to. And Brad, I see you raised your hand. Did you have something to add to that? I, I do, thank you. So for part of the Section 106 um, process as we work through that, we will be inviting the Park Service to be a consulting party. So that I think will help um, to, to a point to address those concerns as we try to preserve the historic aspects of that area. Over. Thank you. Um, Dave, are you gonna chime in as well? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I thought that um, what the law that established the MINRA, the Secretary of the Interior had to make a, a compatibility determination of some sort. So I'm, I was expecting that we would get that determination from National Park Service as part of this NEPA process or maybe later on over. Well, thanks everybody for chiming in to address that. It sounds like there's gonna be some continued discussion and coordination to address that um, in more depth moving forward. Um, for now, let's move on to the next comment. It looks like there's one that came into the email address, so thanks for um, using that. Uh, from a Minneapolis resident, the study says it's about more than just navigation. It's about whether there's a federal interest for the Corps to stay. Why hasn't the Corps considered water supply as a federal interest more thoroughly? Um, I can maybe take a first stab at that and then see if there's anything you'd like to add, Nan. We did look at that and our alternative 2A, uh, partial disposal, where the Corps would stay on site and work with a non-federal partner to uh, cost share future O&M funds that would require a newly authorized purpose at the site, such as water supply. Um, and ultimately, that alternative was screened out for a, a number of reasons, some of which Nan mentioned, um, one of which is certainly that it doesn't result in significant cost savings to the federal government. Um, so from that standpoint, uh, not the best cost benefit analysis. But another significant reason that we screened out that alternative is because of that requirement to identify a new non-federal sponsor or re-enter a partnership with the city of Minneapolis as a non-federal sponsor for a newly authorized purpose and mission uh, being water supply. So that um, kind of opens up its own set of worms as far as justifying that purpose and bringing in the cost share partner to, to be responsible for those costs over the long term. So it's certainly something that we looked at um, and ultimately screened out. Um, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, I guess I, I would just like to add that there's plenty of interest in the core just staying there, um, but not in any interest in help, uh, sharing the cost of us staying there. So that's kind of the, the big the big issue is like, okay, yeah, water supply, and you know, is important regionally, um, but who is going to uh, shoulder the cost of the core to remain there? Over. Thank you. Okay, so this one is specifically looking at section 2.4 of the uh, draft report and the planning objectives. There are only two objectives. The second one is support future visions for continued use of Upper St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam by stakeholders and the public. Um, and the question is, given the negative comments from many stakeholders, how is the planning objective being met? Um, so I guess I would kind of respond to that on, on two angles. Uh, first, it's our view that by offering the monetary incentive and hoping to bring forward a willing owner, that we will be able to bring forward someone who uh, is going to be able to develop some of those future uses at the site. We know there's a lot of local interest in how the site is used and there are future visions and a lot of uh, interest and enthusiasm for the future use of the site. And 
Um, it's our intention that by uh, recommending a plan that will facilitate a negotiated transfer, direct conveyance to a willing entity, that that will best support those visions. Um, and as we've talked about, this vision or this plan is compatible with the direction of WERDA 2020 to convey some of the surrounding lands to the city of Minneapolis, which can be used for development of those future visions um, in tandem with our recommendation to convey the remaining property uh, to a willing entity. So it's, it's our view that we are able to uh, support those future visions um, through the full disposal. And I guess the, the second element of my response would be um, we are just in the process of, of hearing comments and receiving comments and we'll be able to get a more holistic view of stakeholder input at the end of our comment period. Um, anything you want to add? No. Okay, going on then. Okay, next one. Why has the Corps not addressed the federal mandate to enact WERDA 2020 bill to proceed to partial disposal of land that requires you to dispose of this land as soon as practicable? Um, so this has, has come up a couple times as far as expediently uh, following that directive and I'll just, I guess, reiterate that that's certainly our intention. Um, anytime that Congress passes legislation, we are in a little bit of a holding pattern until we receive implementation guidance telling us what to do, how to do it, and how to pay for it. So we certainly intend to comply with the directives of Board of 2020, um, but we are a little bit in a holding pattern as we wait for that implementation guidance. Is there anything you would add to that, Nan? Uh, no, I do see that this was from Mark Andrew and he was at the meeting that we had with the city at the end of um, January, January 20th. So we have started the discussions and I think that there were um, some actions that the city had to take to designate the Friends of the Falls as their designee in this matter. Um, and other things, you know, bookkeeping and uh, that, that need to occur. But um, like I said, this can go on concurrently. We don't have to wait until um, this study is over in order to start that but again, we're waiting for implementation guidance on how to do it. Over. Thank you. Okay, moving on here. The navigation needed for the Headwater Reservoir is ended in 1940. Has the navigation mission there been deauthorized? Um, it's the first question. And then if not, why does the Corps keep saying the navigation mission at the lock ended so it has no federal interest? There's clearly precedent for the Corps to continue to own, operate, and maintain the lock site given the structure's critical functions. And I will confess, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head the answer to that first question. Has the navigation mission there been deauthorized? Is there? Okay, okay. 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 Um, Dan raising his hand. I'll take you off mute there. Let's give me a moment, sorry. There we go. Uh, the answer to that is no, they have not been deauthorized, many of them. Um, in fact, a lot of those authorizations kind of stick around for a long time. It takes an act of Congress to change the authorization of its structure. Okay, thanks, Dan, for jumping in to answer that. So the answer to that is no, and then if not, why does the Corps keep saying the navigation mission has ended so it has no federal interest? Well, the navigation mission has ended because of the direction uh, in WERDA 2014 to end commercial navigation. And based on, on that fact, there, we were then directed to conduct the disposition study to determine whether or not a federal interest remained. There are sites, as you mentioned, precedent, where the Corps continues to have an authorized purpose or continue to own a site, and we have not been directed to perform a disposition study to uh, investigate whether or not there is a continued federal interest um, as there continues to be aging infrastructure and uh, changes in uses that may be something we're directed to look at more. But um, specifically for this site, the, the navigation mission was specifically ended by WERDA 2014 
and then we were directed to undertake this study to determine whether or not there was a federal interest remaining. Um, anything to add? Um, I, I just wanted to add one thing about the, the reservoirs and you know their need ending in 1940. Does anybody remember the droughts of the 1980s, I think? And maybe, Dan, you remember this. Um, that there was a proposal to release some of the headwaters um, reservoir water, you know, their storage to supplement navigation down on the Mississippi River. So that was, so they're still authorized for supplementing navigation as far as I know. Um, it's not a very popular move to, to do something like that, but that it was discussed as recently as the 1980s. Over. All right, thank you. So we're uh, coming to the last couple questions here um, on the chat, but if there are um, others coming in by email, please go ahead and send those or enter additional ones in chat and we'll get through uh, these last questions here. Um, next is how can full disposal option one or 1A be consistent with WERDA 2020, which directs a partial disposal? Both can't be true at the same time. Um, thanks for that question, and we wanted to provide some clarity around that. Um, I think as Nan mentioned earlier in her presentation, WERDA 2020 was passed by Congress while our draft report was out for public review. Um, so we actually pulled the report down off public review, extended the comment period in order to try to address this and to define uh, full disposal as as Nan mentioned, all lands and properties not otherwise conveyed by word of 2020. So our baseline assumption for future conditions are that the lands directed to be conveyed by word of 2020 uh, will be conveyed as directed and full disposal then is defined as everything that remains uh, not conveyed by that. So we wanted to try to provide some clarity around that and it's our perspective that full disposal is now defined um, based off the future assumption that the entirety of the federally owned lands and property exclude what is to be conveyed by word of 2020 as it's our assumption that that will come to pass in the relatively near future. Um, anything to add on that? Yeah, I just wanted to say that the language of word of 2020 section uh, 356 does not preclude additional uh, legislation being passed concerning the rest of the facility. Over. Okay, so another question here um, on the topic of that conveyance as directed by Order 2020. How long will the partial disposition directed by Congress in Order 2020 take? Understanding that a year of long delay to convey three and a half acres of unneeded, unwanted land will undermine local support for repurposing the land to a public interest. I think the bottom line question is here, how long will it take to convey the property as directed in Word of 2020? Um, I think the short answer is we don't know for sure. <laughs> we can't probably put a number on that today, but um, I'll let you uh, reply to that as well, ma'am. Um, yeah, I think that, that's entirely true. We don't know how long it's going to take. Um, it, um, I, I know that we discussed this in our January meeting, uh, Mark, that we don't know. It depends on how complicated the conveyance is. Um, and, and I really can't respond to your, your comment about uh, undermining local support. That's, something I can't respond to, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try to do it as fast as we can, uh, but there, there are some things that we need to do to make it happen. Okay, and I see another question from John here, and there's also a question um, that was submitted by the internet site. Oh, you know what, Dave? We are already addressed that question from Connor about the water supply. So thanks for copying that in. Um, I think we got that one. If there are other questions coming in to the email or on the internet site, 
um, to our team. Copy those into the chat or let me know if you can make sure we address all of those. Um, let's see, John's question, would the new entity have to coordinate with FERC as the core is now? If so, would the new entity have to operate and maintain the painter gate and related machinery? I think as if the new owner is not a federal entity, um, they wouldn't have to coordinate with FERC as far as I know. Um, if so, would the new entity have to operate and maintain the tainter gate and related machinery? Um, I, that is up to the new owner as to whether or not they choose to operate the machinery. Uh, I understand that Excel Energy does have an interest in um, maintaining a, a certain flow capacity through the dam. Um, so yeah, that, that all depends on the uh, needs and wants of the new owner. Over. Thank you. All right, and it looks like someone has copied some of the language from Word of 2020. Um, so you can see the lines are numbered from the legislative language here. I think that's what the numbers are. Uh, ownership rights from Upper San Jose Falls Lock and Dam shall not be conveyed under this subsection. The secretary shall retain all rights to operate and maintain Upper San Anthony Falls Lock and Dam. How is this consistent? So again, um, as, as Nan and I have kind of been talking about, we recognize the direction to convey uh, land in and around Upper St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam, and as this says, uh, ownership of much of the site will remain the responsibility of the Corps of Engineers, and it's specifically those remaining elements that are being addressed by this disposition study. Um, word of 2020 doesn't rescind a direction from a previous word of bill. It doesn't uh, revoke our responsibility to complete the study. It doesn't remove our purpose in the disposition study, it does change to some degree the scope as when we look at the uh, lands and properties that we expect to be owned by the Corps of Engineers, by the Secretary of the Army, that those are smaller in scope uh, given that some of the land will be conveyed by Word of 2020, but we're still directed to look at the ongoing federal interest or lack of federal interest in those sites that we retain ownership of. Um, so I think we've addressed that a couple times and I, I understand it's confusing and that the core viewpoint is uh, not shared by all our stakeholders, but I, um, uh, I think we can, can reiterate that, but I don't know if there's anything else you would add once again, Nan, on that. Uh, yeah, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I think that's a language that's shown here. Um, you know, Congress has not said that um, they're taking away their own rights to do further legislation in this matter. It's just saying that this particular legislation doesn't cover the rest of the lot. But it doesn't, like, like I said, it doesn't preclude Congress from passing additional legislation concerning the rest of the lot. And Shelley goes on to ask, isn't that a congressional direction to retain and operate the lock itself? Um, I guess I don't want to get too into the weeds and speak out of turn. We don't have implementation guidance for Word of 2020. Um, at this point, we uh, see a direction to convey certain elements of the property, and we will be following those directions and waiting for guidance on that. If there is additional direction as to the uh, longevity or details surrounding direction to retain um, that may be forthcoming in further guidance. Um, as of now, that's really no change to our status quo to operate and maintain the upper San Jose Falls Lock and Dam. What changes as far as the status quo are the lands that are directed to be conveyed. Um, so we're still following our direction to look at the feasibility of disposition of the elements that are owned and operated by the Corps. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, there's a question. Did we answer the one from uh, completely from Shelley? I think so, as best I can. If you have anything to add, go ahead. No, I think I think that's all I had. Um, and then one from Edna, who provides implementation guidance. Um, I believe the uh, guidance is um, developed by the core headquarters. Um, what they will do is they will uh, publish a uh, notice in the Federal Register uh, for 60 days seeking input to the implementation guidance, and then they will develop it and um, issue it, um, you know, down to the rest of the core. So there, there's a, an opportunity for uh, input to whatever guidance is developed. But it is done by the core headquarters. Okay, question here. So the core from Whitney. So the core plans to continue to own and operate the lot. Which portion would be left over after conveyance of a portion to the city? And um, believe that at this time the city is only interested in portions of the real estate. Um, we haven't done a survey or you know walked the site exactly to. Um, identify what areas would be conveyed that's yet to be uh, determined. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, and, and according to um, Section 356 of the Word of 2020, the um, amount to be conveyed under that um, order or that, that law um, do, does have to meet with the um, needs of the federal government. So if the, uh, the core of the United States needs to uh, retain a portion of the lands in order to um, operate and maintain the lock structure, which it is still you know, retaining, um, then that portion would not be conveyed to the city. Um, and uh, Section 356 also has a lot of language about not only like a fee title um, transfer, but also some easements as well. So there could be a combination of the two uh, wrapped up in that conveyance. It sounds like from our team members that are monitoring the email, nothing else has come in there. Um, just another reminder though, for everyone who's participated today, Thank you for your questions and um, anything that you want to have formally captured on the record as a comment during our public comment period does need to be submitted in writing. So um, use that email address or send a note to our district office um, so that we can make sure we uh, capture the, the comments and input uh, for the record. We'll see in a couple more moments if anybody has um, additional questions for us. I see a few folks are starting to drop off. Um, we really appreciate everybody attending. It will be uh, nice when we can have these in an the auditorium face-to-face -face again, but I appreciate everybody joining us virtually for our virtual public meeting and uh, engaging with uh, great questions for us in the chat. So we'll stay on for a couple moments here and see if any other questions come in um, before we adjourn. There's another question. So um, I'll, I'll read this from Whitney. Um, so I'm hearing that one, per word of 2020, the core intends to retain ownership of the lock structure until we can get rid of it, yes. Uh, the core plans to comply with Word of 2020 to convey a portion to the city, yes. The 
court will dispose of the residual property if an owner can be found, yes, and if Congress authorizes us to do so. And finally, uh, from John Antonson, can we get a list of who attended? Uh, do we have that available? Um, not everyone logged in with their full name. We didn't really do a roll call, but we'll have um, in documentation of this meeting at least the total number of attendees, um, but I don't know that we would uh, list attendees by name because we didn't ask for that or do a roll call. So another question here, until you get rid of it in quotes, by what authority would the core get rid of it? Well, uh, the recommendation we're making and the outcome we're seeking on that front is what's recommended in the disposition study report, which would be uh, a congressional action to grant us the authority to make a direct conveyance to a willing owner. And then also from Chris, uh, Chris um, if through GSA no owner comes forward, will it just be mothballed or does the core retain ownership? Um, I think there have been past attempted conveyances where the core has tried to uh, dispose of property and GSA was not able to find a new owner and so it reverted back to the um, to the core to try again, I think. Um, yeah, there uh, have been um, lock structures that have been effectively mothballed for, for decades without finding a new owner. And I think that there's probably um, a lot of potential for other things to be done with this site rather than to let that happen. I guess maybe I would just add to that, um, this is framed as an either or question. I don't necessarily think it's either or. If a new owner doesn't come forward, it could remain in core ownership and be mothballed because of uh, no funding for O&M. Okay, Will this sure. meet recording be made available? <laughs> Sorry, Nan and I are both jumping on at the same time. Yes, it will be made available. This will be posted on our website. Um, it does take about a day or two for the meetings to be generated through WebEx. So I would look for it to be posted um, on our website by the end of the week. I think our rule of thumb here is that we will hold on for five minutes, and if we don't get another question, we will end the meeting.
Well, thanks again to everybody who uh, joined us today and for those that are still hanging on till the end here. Um, not seeing any additional comments, we'll uh, wait one or two more minutes and then I'm going to go ahead and close the meeting and the recording will be posted by the end of the week. Thanks again to our team as well for jumping in to help us answer the questions. We appreciate everybody joining us here in the WebEx room today.